All right. All right, one second. Trying to go live on YouTube. Okay, have a look. Yes, I believe we're live. Say that. Okay. okay, thank you, Maxim. All right, thank you. And uh, so welcome uh, to this uh, June edition of our OWASP Belgium virtual chapter meeting. Uh, today, we are very happy that uh, both Mark Curfee and Jason Nichols of Open Raven have joined us. And they'll be um, not only talking, but also demoing a really interesting open source tool called Crawl. Uh, that's uh, some kind of like discovery tool for cloud, uh, cloud settings. Before that, let me first pitch uh, our upcoming sessions. So this is part of a series of uh, Belgian virtual chapter meetings. Um, so last month we actually had Jeremiah Grossman. Uh, today we have Mark, and then like in, in a couple of months we also have Andrew Vanderstock. Uh, so we'll have uh, we have quite a couple of like uh, people that were at the start of OWASP uh, already, already 20 years ago. Um, so and then in October Steve Springer will also join us talking about S bombs. This is quite a hot topic as well. We do this each month. We'll be skipping July and August as we take holidays quite seriously here in Europe. Uh, but out of September, you can join us every Thursday of the month at, seven, at, at five o'clock uh, Central European time. Um, and then if you want to get noticed, uh, get notifications about this, subscribe to this uh, channel on YouTube. Uh, and obviously, if you subscribe to our mailing lists, you will not only get our spam, but updates on any upcoming sessions. Hopefully we'll be able to do this also live or in hybrid format during the fall period. So with that, I'll give the word, word to um, Mark and Jason. It's uh, up to you guys. Thank you for joining us. Great, thank, thank you, you very much. Um, yeah, so I'll actually be on the OWASP keynote. I think it's September, 20 years on, which is, uh, which is interesting. I think Sebastian and I first met in Ghent, God knows how many years ago, but I think we were both looking a lot, a lot younger then and how, how things have changed, right, since those, um, since those early days of OWASP for sure. Um, what we're gonna talk about today though, and by the way, I'm more than happy to answer questions or anything, talk about OWASP Foundation, you know, how it started and all of that, if anyone's interested in questions around it at the end. But um, what we're gonna talk about today is, is cloud. Um, and part of the reason I, when I first got into application security, I guess 20, 20 odd years ago, it was everyone was moving stuff to the web. Um, and so all of these issues started to occur We've got very similar conditions that are happening today. Um, everyone's moved stuff to the cloud. And to a large extent, the security people have been behind the curve on it. Um, and as a result, we're, we're seeing significant problems. Um, and so what we have built, and we're actually gonna be releasing it, it's at Black Hat Arsenal, it's the official release, but some of the code is being, the code is being developed in the, in the open. Um, and I think Black Hat Arsenal is August, I wanna say August 4th or something. Um, we, so it'll be officially released then, but here's kind of essentially a preview. And um, what Magpie is, is an open source CSPM. So it stands for Cloud Security Posture Manager, which basically is a vulnerability checker for, for, um, for the cloud, for AWS and, and GCP. So we'll, we'll run through that. Um, highly, of course, relatable to people that are involved in application security. And what, what I've seen happen is that we've moved from a world where we predominantly wrote everything ourselves. Um, you know, if you go back again, 20 years, you know, I was at Josh Schwab, I was building an authentication and user management system for 8 million users. You know, these days, you know, most people are, are using things like Okta and, and, and providers, Google and, and various other things. So we're moving to this world from an application security world where it's a lot more declarative than it used to be, which makes the cloud very relevant to understand for both developers, security people building applications, et cetera. So, Hence the relevance, hopefully, for you guys. Um, what I'll do um, is um, is kind of quickly walk through, you know, the landscape of cloud, cloud security tools, just so people kind of understand the the various pieces. Um, super whiz why we why why we're building Magpie and why we built it. We'll go through the architecture, security rules, um, and and Jason will kind of kind of come in come in there. 
Um, we'll talk about a couple of plugins that we've we've also built that have solved very specific problems for the CISOs, um, particularly around finding shadow cloud accounts. So these are things that you know someone just puts in their credit card, spins up their own data center these days. How, how do you get visibility into that? Um, and then another plugin which is around identifying um, non-native data stores. Um, and then Jason will go through a demo so you can kind of see where it is. Um, and and yeah, and then we'll then we'll go from there. So so hopefully that's okay. Feel free to, to anyone interject at any point, ask questions. Um, I don't see the questions here on my on my screen, but um, yeah, but we'll, awesome. uh, yeah, indeed we welcome Great. any questions. We'll channel them from both from YouTube live stream and uh, the webinar questions here. Yeah, definitely. wonderful, wonderful. So when a lot of people think, well, most people think about the cloud, it's AWS, Azure you know, Google Cloud, right, um, GCP. Um, there's loads of others, of course, DigitalOcean and, you know, Rackspace and IBM's one, I forget what that's, what that's called, for sure. But it's predominantly the three big players. And of course, you know, these things are dominating, right? Uh, you know, AWS is even dominating Amazon's, um, you know, revenue line. Um, Azure is the thing. I was at Microsoft for a long time. And just, you know, everything was like, hey, it's Xbox and Azure, like Windows was, you know, Windows was kind of a decade ago. Um, and so these things just really fundamentally change things. And I think a lot of people are fairly skeptical about the, the fundamental change that was happening um, in a similar way that people were skeptical originally about mobile development. But now, you know, it's mainstream. We're all, we're all comfortable with, with these things. And, you know, looking back, it's like, yeah, what an amazing, amazing revolution. But what a lot of people don't know is that there's a second cloud revolution happened. And I spend, you know, a lot of time with with VCs, venture, um, you know, venture investors, and spend time both kind of, you know, helping them kind of look at look at specific companies, but just sort of understanding the landscape. And you know, you could think a lot about uh, uh, people have a varied set of opinions about VCs. But one thing I can tell you is, like, they are incredibly intuitive about where markets are going and where to invest. And they are all over the, the essentially what they believe is the next generation of the cloud, which is happening now. And if you think that the first generation of the cloud essentially commoditized hardware and operating systems, you know, it basically took, you know, hey, you don't need to go pay for your Windows or Windows license. You don't need to go buy a server like, you know, just, just, just click here. It becomes a commodity. They drive down the price based on volume. But they drive the, you know, Ability. You don't have to go manage these things. Well, the same thing's happening with data right now and applications. So Snowflake is, is probably the most, you know, kind of widely known one. Um, Snowflake IPO went public uh, on the NASDAQ, I think, uh, late last year. It's worth about $60 billion. And Snowflake really is nothing more than Amazon's Lake Foundation and S3 buckets underneath the hood. It's wrapped in a nice user experience. Um, but it basically commoditizes those services and makes them easy to use. And so that second generation of the cloud, we're starting to see. And we've seen it first with, with data. And in many ways, you can think of these things as multi-cloud. It's not really multi-cloud. It's a single cloud for a single service. But we're going to start to see this more and more as we build declarative applications that use certain things for certain, you know, certain tasks. So whilst we've seen it with, with data storage, we're seeing it with you know, authentication with, with things like Okta. You're gonna to start to see it for all of these different, you know, different services that, that we provide, which makes a very interesting space for applications. It's no longer even the stuff that when you think about kind of what you have to go and assess, it's a giant, great big spider web. It's a giant, great big hub and spoke model of all of these places where data is coming in, you know, authentication and you know, authorization and what data is flowing and all of that stuff is 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 super interesting. Um, but the, this trend is definitely the second generation of the cloud. It is revolutionizing what's happening. The first generation, all of this kind of standard, you know, cloud compute was was really focused around a kind of a couple of core cool services. So it was compute, general, you know, virtual machines, containers, serverless, so if you're familiar with you know, AWS, it's, you know, it's Fargate and, you know, Lambda functions for, for serverless compute, but every single one of these cloud providers just have. Mark, I just want to, uh, to, to, to have, are you by any chance like uh, sharing a presentation? Because oh, 
what yes. you're seeing is your 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 main desktop and not the presentation itself. Mm. Oh, I am so sorry. Hold on. Because I'm well, fine. <laughs> you're explaining things and they all make sense, <laughs> but there's probably also a supporting presentation. There is. Is that better? That is definitely better. I am so sorry. No problem. <laughs> so, okay. So this is the first slide, Cloud, yep. Cloud 101. This is what we have with the data data revolution. Indeed. And great. And then, okay. And so now we're back to the, 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 the compute. So yeah. what we're generally seeing across all three of those, um, the, the, those cloud providers is basically the same. So, you know, compute, it's virtual machines, containers, serverless functions, lambdas in AWS, but GCP has the same. You're then seeing storage, you know, so file storage, object storage, backup. The most popular and most kind of, you know, well-known, of course, is S3, um, which is unbounded, you know, storage. It's basically you have as many objects and as big a bucket as you want, right? Which is why it's become utility storage. But Azure has the same, it's blob storage. Google has the same. It's not just a, a, an, a, an Amazon thing. You then have all these networking services, so software-defined networks and VPCs, virtual private clouds, and all of these things. Of course, we've got databases. And in the reality in the world of um, you know, the cloud, we've got native databases. So RDS, which really is just Postgres, Oracle, MySQL. Actually, I don't think it's MySQL, but a few other databases wrapped in the service with RDS, relational data store. Um, but they have everything right in there. There's you know, key value stores and, and you know, managed elastic search, et cetera. Um, you've got all the big data and analytics stuff. So Lakehouse, Glue, all of these, these things that will do you know, the old style Hadoop, not the modern style kind of data stuff. And then you've got identity, you know, identity and access management, KMS, et cetera. So again, from the perspective of the audience of application security people, we're in this declarative world where we're building apps for the cloud, IAM is very important, right? It's, that's how identity and access is typically being done, maybe mapped back. We've got KMS, we've got a, you know, a crypto system that we can go use keys um, to for. Um, and the question comes, you know, when you look then at the cloud model, it's a very, it's a, you know, in some way, it's a very clever model by the cloud providers. It's shared responsibility. <laughs> and what shared responsibility ultimately means is that, you know, they're responsible for some things and you're responsible for all the others. And the things, of course, that you're responsible for is all the stuff that's at the bottom, which is essentially making sure that you know, you've taken care of the security configurations of all the options that they give you. Um, you know, they're not responsible for, for vulnerability management. They're not responsible for, hey, you know, you're not rotating your keys and you've chosen options. And like everything, and I'm sure everyone sees this in applications, you know, they'll provide a set of default options which are easy to use. They're, they're driven by, by user experience. And so a lot of these problems are occurring because of that. Um, and that there's a vast amount of knowledge that's needed. And the developers now have to understand both how the cloud works and how to build applications, which has that increase for what we thought was going to be into a simplicity model. The complexity is actually significantly increased for a lot of them. If we look at the cloud tools landscape, there is, there's a, there's a vast array of it, right? There's loads and loads of stuff. And, um, you know, full disclosure, I'm a, I'm a vendor and so, you know, all of the vendors, you know, everything's trying to be slightly unique and it's just the way of the world. And I think you guys know there's been more money plowed in through through venture capital than, than ever before into the space. And so you've got more and more tools and more and more vendors. And of course, you know, the opposite way is going. You know, chief security officers want less and less tools, right? Not more and more tools. Um, so, but in general, the kind of landscape, and this is generally played out by, by the sort of gardeners of the world, um, is that you have what are called cloud security posture managers. So, you know, you've probably heard of, of sort of Divi Cloud, Laceworks, and, you know, uh, Palo Alto, Prisma, et cetera. Um, and in general, what those tools are doing is configuration checking. And that's what Magpie is, but we have aspirations to do it slightly different, and I'll kind of explain, explain that. You then have a set of tools, and, and in general, those things are based on native APIs. So basically, all the cloud cloud APIs of AWS or GCP or, or, or Azure. Um, and there's a, there's a gap there in doing that, which I'll explain, which is what that um, you know, DMAP uh, tool, tool covers. You then have 
cloud workflow, uh, cloud platform um, workload protection tools, which are generally based on protecting Kubernetes and the containers that sit inside. So for the most part, non-native or agents deployed on the Linux containers. Um, I say for the most part, Amazon and all of these other places provide, of course, managed Kubernetes. But in reality, what we see is that very few people use those because they're behind and that Kubernetes, because it's open source, is moving so fast that the innovation is, is ahead of what the managed services are in that, in that particular space. Um, so that's the top. And what, what you'll see happening out there is that that's collapsing, right? Um, you know, Palo Alto are building a giant portfolio of all of those into a single pane of glass, et cetera. What you see then in the bottom part is an emerging category, data security posture management, because ultimately everyone's trying to protect against data breaches um, and the data landscape is changing into data, data lake houses and data warehouses, et cetera. And then data workload protection tools. So ho hopefully that's a kind of quick, quick whiz of the cloud and quick whiz of, of, of where the tooling landscape is, which will help frame Magpie. We are built, and with the reason why we're open sourcing Magpie, and, and it's an Apache license, it's properly open sourced, et cetera. Um, and we're, we're kind of following, you know, all the right principles. It's like, you've got to sell, you know, you've got to open source a complete solution, right? It can't be some crippled, you know, crippled where it has to solve a complete problem. It's got to be complete, et cetera. Um, but the reason we're doing it is we had already gone through a whole big process in building this open Raven company deploying you know, to global game companies, global car companies, and learning all the lessons. And what we kept hearing from everyone who had one of these CSBMs is that they're, they're kind of broken. Like they've, they were generally created by companies that, you know, security companies that weren't really born in the cloud, don't really understand the cloud, and they've sort of taken old school networking approaches to doing it. So AWS has, you know, one example is AWS has an organization structure where accounts fall underneath the organizations. And a lot of the CSPM tools at the time, you know, wouldn't deploy into an org. Now, our open source tool doesn't, doesn't either, but we understood these things. We understood about how you deploy at scale and, and the, the implications of all of these things. And it's, it's not trivial. Honestly, when I first got into this, it was like, oh, this is going to be easy because everything in the cloud works the same, right? You know, how untrue that is. Everyone manages their clouds totally different. Some people have lifted and shifted their clouds from the network environment to the cloud. So they basically just replicate the same problems. People manage it in different ways with Terraform and cloud formation and all these different things. And then, so it's crazy. But the general kind of consensus was that. The other general consensus that we heard was that CSBMs will focus on compliance. And what I've seen, and I'm not sure if you guys have seen it, but what I've seen is that you know, compliance is, you know, not security, right? Compliance is a set of checks that you're complying with those things, but you can pass compliance checks till you're blue in the face and, you know, and still have massive insecurities. Um, I think I've told that, I, I have told this story many times before. I once took WebGoat, I reskinned it and got a PCI certification, um, which was, was, was funny and scary all in the same time. Um, but you know that's a kind of example of like of like that. And so what everyone was saying is like this compliance stuff's great. It's configuration management, but I'm still seeing all of these big problems. You know the Equifax type problem, the Capital One type problem, which you know weren't really covered by compliance standards, or really were maybe humanly, but the configuration checks weren't there. So they were generally focused on that. What we've also found is that an awful lot of people, particularly that have lifted and shifted older applications. Um, have generally kind of taken their existing databases and just moved them into the cloud running on general compute on EC2 instances or whatever. And the CSPMs are just unaware of that. So, you know, if you're trying to map a data flow for an application for a security review, or you're trying to understand where the data is being pulled, you essentially go down a cul-de-sac and you just don't know it's connecting to this EC2 instance. Well, oh, it's a Postgres or it's a MongoDB or it's an Elasticsearch. And so the, the CSPMs as a pure kind of tool are just unaware, essentially. Um, and then, you know, we, we used to have on the board of the company, Phil Venables, who's now the CISO at uh, Google Cloud, but was the, the chief security officer at, um, at Goldman Sachs and, and before that at, at, at Dresner and at Climate Benson in London. And, and Phil's, a, Phil's a great guy. And he's one of these sort of, you know, CISO CISOs and incredibly pragmatic. And he said, look, the challenge that I see all security tools having is completeness. So when you ask someone, you know, hey, are you scanning everything? So do we know everything? Or have you deployed endpoints onto everything? So do we, do we know we have protection? 
you know, people will kind of say, well, what? hey, look, we've got, you know, 35,000 laptops and I've got it deployed on 35,000 things. And it's like, well, how do you know you got 35,000 laptops? And the answer typically comes back because that's how many is registered in AD. And it's like, well, <laughs> maybe not, right? And, and it's typically kind of those edge cases that cause the, cause the security problems. And the, the cloud security people don't do about that and um, don't haven't really thought about that because it's a real, but it's a real, a real problem. Um, so, so that's that. And then the, you know, the bottom reasons are the reasons why, why we as a commercial company can kind of go, go build it as a commercial open source. We have four full-time employees working on, on, on this. Um, we're ultimately an open core company. We believe in an open source. So, you know, started OWASP, have this, this long history of it. And I just think it's the right thing to do. You've got to be able to give back and you can't keep taking from, from the world. Um, and CSPM ultimately kind of is something just everyone should have. It's, it, it's, it's a commodity. So, sorry, I'm on two laptops now. That's wrong, wrong way. Which way do we go? Oh, going backwards. Hold on, I can use slides. So what Magpie is, is oh gosh i'm so sorry what magpie is is ultimately and um, what will be released at black hat um black hat arsenal but of course we have we have this um it's being developed out in out in the open now is essentially two editions one you can run from your laptop which jason will demonstrate through through docker but also we're building it essentially in a reference architecture that you can deploy into a modern data stack so by that we mean you know using a warehouse to to warehouse your data um, and and be able to push it out into into things like data lakes or being able to push it out into things like security orchestration systems. The desktop edition is you know hey I want to go run an assessment on on my AWS environment or a client's AWS environment like have at it from your desktop go you know scan you know Acme Corp away you go. But if you want to put it into you know, a large environment, you can, you can architect it in the right way that, that, that runs. Um, and essentially it works in, in a system of, um, Jason will pop up and, and correct me for being pointy head boss and, and bastardizing it. Um, but, and look, he smiled and he'll have no problem in doing that, believe, believe you me. Um, never. Never, but, um, but essentially it's, it's a, a first in first out, you know, queuing system. So there are ways that you can do the cloud providers. So we have AWS and GCP, out the bat at Arsenal, at the Black Hat Arsenal, but we will also be, be working on an Azure one for sure and, and other plugin systems. There's actually a, a company here in the States that's looking at um, importing actually network data from OS Query and other things. So you can aggregate it from all in. Then there's a layer that processes stuff and then there's a layer that essentially outputs it to wherever you, you want to go. And the default installation Jess will show you is with Postgres. Um, in, in there of, of, of how that works. Um, Jason, maybe I, I'll hand over to you for the, the reality of that architecture. Certainly. So yeah, Magpie is a, a, a more of a framework than application and all of its features, all of its functionality is implemented via plugins. So we have you know plugins for AWS, GCP, like Mark said, uh, Azure is coming up in the pipeline as well. That's for the enumeration stage. We have you know, layers for various operations. Um, enumeration is top level. You've got queries and transforms filtering, then an output uh, layer at the bottom. By default, it's just enumeration and output. Um, and these FIFOs by default are all in one, one process. They're just Java queues. But the abstraction allows you to put those through Kafka as well. So you might have a distributed um, discovery for um, uh, architecture where you've got multiple machines doing discovery across, across your environments that all funnel down into one layer where they are put through security rules for violations. So it, it's, it's, it's designed to be very flexible, but by default, it runs seamlessly on, on a laptop, for example. So this is the flow for Magpie discovery, Magpie policy. Magpie is broken up into two main executables, discovery being obviously cloud discovery, policy being the application of defined policies and rules against that discovered data. And we use Postgres as our persistent source for that. Um, and that was a, a conscious decision to tie Magpie to Postgres because uh, we store a lot of the, the raw provider JSON, whether it's AWS or GCP, you know, that we discover. So it, it remains uh, provider agnostic, but Postgres has the powerful search capabilities with, with JSON inside of JSON tables, JSON rows. 
or columns, I mean. So we've tied the Postgres as a conscious decision. And I think you can never go wrong with Postgres is, is the general rule. So um, as I think Mark has slides going up on this, uh, on the rule format, is that correct, Mark? Yeah, yeah. What I, uh, I don't know whoops. if that's farther ahead. We can come back to that later I, if you want. I think it is. Maybe I, maybe I, <laughs> I, killed, the, I killed the rule slide, I'm sorry. That's uh -huh. all right. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll give a bit of color before Jason kind of goes in there. Is that, you know, j just running. So, so we basically have opted for SQL. In, in our product, we, 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 we first experimented using a thing called OPA, which is the open policy agent from the CNCF, um, Cloud Native Security Format, um, Cloud Native Co uh, Computing Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation, um, which, by the way, I'm trying to encourage OWASP to go become a part of, but that's another, another conversation. Um, but um, CNCF, you know, things like OPA and all these things have mass appeal across mass infrastructure. Um, but the problem with OPA is that it wasn't suitable for writing complex security rules. And of course, most security people also don't understand it. It's another thing they have to learn. What we found is that, of course, most people understand SQL. Um, not these days from SQL injection, because I think, you know, that's, you know, you, you, you use... Uh, you know, strike that problem away um, these days for the most part, but um, but most people understand SQL, I guess, lower barrier to entry. Also in the data science world, SQL has seen a massive resurgence. Um, if you're interested, there's a company called DBT, which is uh, basically sort of normalizes data and, and manages, you know, data schemas and things, which is just on fire. Because what they found is that all of these various data query languages, Gremlin, Cypher, et cetera, were also complex and everyone was managing their own, that it's kind of like Python. It's like, you know, hey, everything just normalizes back down to something which everyone can agree on and, you know, sod the discussion around, hey, this is slightly better than that. It's kind of comes back. So we said SQL, SQL made most sense for querying configuration checks. But what we also learned is that um, to do a lot of the complex security rules or the interesting things, you can't just rely on the data that you have. You want to go correlate that data against other things. So we can also run a Python evaluator. So we haven't written any Python rules. We focused first on just getting, you know, uh, feature parity with uh, the, the commercial CSPMs. Um, but all the rules are managed in Git repos. So you can go clone the rules, go create your own rules. Um, but the types of things you might be able to do, for instance, is, hey, I've got a security group here that has access to, the, to this particular IP on the internet. Let me go look it up, you know, go correlate it with a, you know, command and control database. Like, oh, this thing's can communicating to this known command and control database. Or this thing is, you know, owned by these people, uh, as an example. And, and many other types of things. Look, hey, you know, we have... We have a set of, you know, the owners of our of our internal resources or whatever's whatever's been tagged, maybe in you know vulnerability management systems internally. Like, hey, this container we know contains these issues. So, you know, hey, let me let me figure out all the containers that are running. You can go run a lookup against the CV database and say, yeah, actually these things are running are running this. So that's generally how that works. What what else? What did I miss, Jason? In that? I think you've covered it pretty well. So we can, we'll, we'll, we'll demo some, some rules in a sec. Um, this is, is a really interesting um, thing. So this, um, I don't know what the official name is eventually going to be. I, I, I put work there. Internally, this is called DMAP, which is a nod to NMAP. So what we've also found is a mass problem in evaluating discovery inside of AWS. Like, what do I have? Was this problem around, if you just use the native APIs, it's relatively easy to go get back to, you know, here's all my S3s, here's all my EC2s, here's my quantum ledgers, here's my Lambda functions, here's whatever I have. But most people lifted and shifted into the cloud. They took existing applications and just moved them in the cloud first versus rebuilding them cloud being cloud native. Uh, as a result, you have no clue ultimately what you know what you have um, how do I how do I know I've got a MongoDB or an Elasticsearch instance and so I could have an EC2 instance that's open to the world and it has to have Elasticsearch on which is just exposing my entire data it becomes a mass problem um, so what we did with with that is essentially build a system that you know you can think of it as like photo recognition we on the back end spin up applications in a Fargate cluster Fargate's the container um, system from, from Amazon. We build essentially a profile of everything. So we, we basically barrage the thing with, you know, buffers and, and frames and all sorts of things. We don't build a signature per se. We just have a record of all the, of all the different things. So 
you know, it's it's essentially a picture of, you know, like, let's say I've got a picture of Sebastian. And, you know, then what happens is we then go and do the same thing inside of the, the cloud environment. We spin up a Lambda function so it lands next to the data store. And then you go do the same profiling. And then it comes back and says, yeah, I'm 95% sure that's Sebastian, but he doesn't have his glasses on today. And so you can say, great, you know, I think that's Oracle. Um, so irrelevant to what port it's running or configuration or banners removed or whatever. You guys have probably seen this with, you know, HTTP fingerprinting and Linux stack fingerprinting and all those things. But what it allows you to do is to go figure out where all those, those applications are. Um, and that will be open sourcing as well, probably be called, called DMAP. Now, the reality is most people won't want to go run that infrastructure on the back end because, you know, being, having spinning up all these containers and refining it and we've got, you know, we've got models that, you know, we'll check, hey, this is, you know, the, the recall on this is not okay. And this is actually a higher prediction than that. But we'll open source the whole thing. And then people can, uh, we'll probably open source a, a fingerprinting kit um, that allows you to say, great, I've got this, um, which you could also use for your own applications. If you've got, you know, an internally developed application, uh, go build your own fingerprints against it and go check where else that thing is, uh, is deployed. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and in general, kind of the way it works is there's this fingerprint database, which has been generated um, and it runs as that decision tree, essentially. So, you know, here's my, here's my app it runs into this, this ML model that, that basically builds the information to go make the decision and run the decision tree. That information gets stored and then it goes out, you know, to the user essentially as a, as a prediction um, of how that, how that works. Um, the other thing um, that we're using, and I'm sorry, I didn't take all the logos off, but it, it's not going to be called BlueJ. Um, everyone's obsessed by Corbett's at work. Um, that's the Raven thing, right? But um, but um, what this is solving that problem that I mentioned that Phil Venable said. Um, so this is super cool. We we actually deployed this to a US university. We had 140,000 student accounts running through this, which is which was super cool. Um, so essentially what it, what it does is it's a bit sneaky. It basically acts like a spam filter and you deploy it into your, your corporate mail. Um, and what it does is watches for AWS accounts that come in. Um, and those AWS accounts, we basically look for the bill. We pass the bill, we find the accounts. We then look at Magpie, what Magpie's discovered. And then you say, ah, Sebastian's actually getting billed for this account. And we don't know about that account. So that's his own own little thiefdom that he's that he's built over there um and it's super interesting you can also build signatures out for things like snowflake and even things like dropbox so you get a sense of what's running in the cloud like what cloud services are being used which ones do you know about and which ones are under management um obvious privacy implications um i think you guys know people in the us is basically you don't care about privacy it's like hey whatever i know in the you know, under, under EU regulations, getting access to someone's email box and, and all of that requires, you know, permissions and everything. But, um, but proven to be, you know, super useful and super effective. And it's one of those kind of, you know, one tool in the arsenal of finding where these, these shadow, shadow cloud accounts are, which are becoming a real problem for people. When I can spin up my own data center using a credit card, it goes outside of securities control. And then all of these things are just essentially not on board. Um, we will be putting that stuff up into all of this discovery stuff into a set of free 3D maps. This won't be open source, but will be a plugin to Magpie, which basically goes up and generates essentially an architecture diagram. So when people have done threat models, super, super interesting to kind of figure out like where does data flow, who has access to this thing, um, all of that type of stuff. So we've built these 3D maps that can essentially consume the data um, and you can play interactively. So you can, you know, go over, I think this is Cambridge Analytica down in the bottom corner. What do they have access into? Oh, they have access into a Hadoop cluster here. Here's how data flows. Oh, this, this VPC is peered with here. So here's how data can flow between these things. Oh, why is this data, you know, being written into this bucket and being replicated over to this thing? So it becomes very interesting to build essentially, you know, architecture maps, but also for things like threat modeling. Uh, how we anticipate that being used. Um, so with that, I'll, 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 I'll drop off the, the general kind of, you know, kind of plan is that the stuff that is on the, the Q3, uh, so Q2, Q2 releases there, we've got a bunch of ideas of doing things like 
you know, Terraform drift analysis. So here's what Terraform thinks is deployed. Here's what's really deployed. Like, hey, what is not under management of Terraform? Um, things like looking up, you know, AMIs to CVEs and, and and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, so with that, maybe maybe I maybe I pause and I haven't been able to check, but and hand over to Jason. I'll stop sharing. If that's uh, that's good. No, you stop. Good. Well, so in the meantime, yeah. just mention anyone anyone who's listening on this through uh, through the webinar or to YouTube. If you have any questions so far, just pop them up in the in the chat or in the live stream so that you can relay them. So, uh, with that, yeah, just go ahead. Great. Yeah, I'll do a screen share and we'll walk through a quick demo and kind of highlight some of the salient points of, of Magpie that are, are worth discussing here as well. All right. So I want to show off real quick. Mark mentioned the um, you know the rules and policies. Those are online today. We've got uh, Open Raven on GitHub um, slash AWS CIS 1.2. We have all of these rules for 1.2 implemented for AWS. Uh, single policy that is the foundation rules that implement or that you know reference many of the rules here. So these are all done today. They're functional today. Um, you can run Magpie um, really easily, uh, as I'll demonstrate in a second, and try these rules out in your organization or your account on AWS. So we have a uh, repository I've created called uh, Magpie Quick Run. I'll just jump to that real quick here. Um, and this is a, a really a, a, a Docker Compose setup that wraps Magpie inside Docker, as well as the required Postgres instance. So you can really get a, a one command um, you know, uh, evaluation of Magpie and run it in your local environment uh, right off the bat here. That's what I'll demo today. So what happens, I've got uh, Magpie cloned here. Um, I've set some environmental variables for the AWS credentials that I won't show off here on, on the demo, obviously. And we'll run this. Um, the way I have it configured right now is Magpie um, by default will scan all AWS services that we support, which is a long list available on, on the Magpie repository. Um, we've got a, a fairly you know, lengthy list here of services. I've narrowed it down for today, just the IAM, because even that will, will give you a, a fair set of results. So kicking off Magpie, it will spin up the, the Docker uh, Compose environment and then initiate the Magpie scan. And what this will do is it'll literally just walk through all of the AWS um, uh, I am accounts and roles and, and various settings on the account, then apply that, uh, it'll persist that into the database and then apply the rules against that. This takes maybe five, 10 minutes to run. So um, as it is, I've already got a complete scan worth of data in Postgres. And I can jump to that and, and show off how that's stored um, while this scan runs. But um, we just iterate through all of the, ver the various um, 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 assets in I am right now. So if I jump to Postgres, we've got so far discovered, um, you know, I am accounts, policies, roles, and users. I, that allows me to run queries against it at any point in time. So I can jump back to the, uh, the policies we've got here. Um, let me just find that. I can pick one at random, say, um, I had one the other day here, but looking at this, it's, you know, as Mark showed off, we've got, you know, the SQL query is the heart of that. You know, Magpie, you know, uh, uses that as part of our analysis engine for um, for finding finding you know complex queries that you can build. So I've got one already preloaded in here, which was to find any uh, passwords that didn't have the um, um, a certain password policy set. I could run that against the current database, and of course, I lost my connection. My apologies. It worked an hour ago, and it does find one account. Um, one IM role on that account that violates that policy. And you'll see that in the output results here. But I think the key is that we've really kind of embraced um, using standards for um, interacting with Magpie. So it's SQL, it, it's, it's Python, um, additional validation. Everything is defined in YAML. Output comes out in a, a text report. Magpie is really a CLI based app that is easily wrapped in a, um, in a enterprise environment. So this is almost done. I apologize for the, the slow scan on that. Um, it's a big account, I suppose. But what we've got here is on Open Raven, by default, the Magpie project is um, everything you need to run Magpie. It does have AWS built into it with the, uh, the AWS plugin. We've also got a GCP plugin that is nearly uh, nearing completion that'll be integrated back into uh, Magpie 
project proper very shortly. These repositories are all open source um, and they're available for you know, editing or hacking or forking as it is right now. The, um, the method we've chosen for policies, this is actually running right now against the, uh, there we go. So there's our report. We've got nine violations. We scanned one policy, which was the AWS benchmarks CIS. We've got multiple policies here that are, 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 are violations um, regarding password policies and key rotation, for example. So the, um, the full scan you know, will cover EC2, RDS. It covers all the CIS benchmarks. But for today, I just limited it to IAM only for simplicity. We'll have um, AWS, found, AWS uh, Foundation's GCP CIS rules off the bat as well. And then we'll start building the complex rules. So the rules, you know, this is, is a little bit in flux, will be, will be stable by, by Black Hat. The rules themselves will get wrapped up to policies. Um, right now they're in, you know, a AWS. Essentially the policies will sit inside of the core, um, the core repo, I, I think, Jason, is the way we're going to do it. But the rules format was essentially all of the individual rules will be pushed down to a separate repo. So you can either clone that repo yourself, modify them, add your own rules, and just pull it straight in so you don't need to share them. Or hopefully what people would do would basically create PRs and add their own rules. Um, so, you know, much more complex rules than sit with the compliance thing. So, you know, hey, this thing can inherit this permission and can assume role into this and therefore that becomes an, a problem. So it's kind of like every time there's been a, you know, a breach or a cloud hack, we can go encapsulate that in, in a combination of SQL and Python, and then everyone can kind of share and go and go run that rule. And that's the, the, the goal. And that runs through Gruel, right, Jason, the, the Python interpreter? We actually use Jython because Gruel Jython, doesn't have yeah. a good embedded solution for Python today, but um, that's the ultimate goal, yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's where we are. Um, we will have default reports, by the way, as well, uh, graphical visual reports. They'll come out of data, data uh, Google's Data Studio. Um, so essentially kind of what you do is you go to Google's Data Studio, which is you know free for the most part. Um, you point back to the Postgres instance, but you could plug in Tableau or you know whatever you, Looker or whatever whatever you want to go write your own reports. So again, the, the data, the, the JSON output is just piped into into Postgres, so you can go, you know, go look at it from that perspective. So if you want proper compliance reports, you could, you know, brand them yourself, go, go do whatever you want um, from that perspective as well. So I think that's it, right? I don't think we, is there anything else we, we haven't covered? I think that covers it all. Great stuff. Great stuff. So, and, um, and, and the tool, it's, it's something you, uh, I would say, uh, the, the scan runs on demand. It's something that from time to time you, you run and you populate your, the, the, the repository, or is there something that you can like, whenever something changes in a target setup, you, you can uh, trigger it and feed it back. You, yeah, you could either run it as a batch mode or you could certainly tag CloudTrail. So any change may, makes place, go reevaluate things, which is, is, is kind of neat, right? Um, We've actually experimented in the past with making configuration changes back. Um, in general, kind of most cloud people will tell you it's either the best idea possible or the most stupid idea possible. It's like either end of the spectrum. There is nothing like, oh, that's interesting. It's like, oh, you are stupid or, oh, that's brilliant. Um, so theoretically, yeah, you could um, you could do that. We're pulling in CloudTrail. I'm not sure if we're streaming CloudTrail in, but again, that architecture allows you to feed it into a queue go watch the queue and, and go make those changes. So yeah, if anyone's interested in doing that before we get to there, have at it, that would be awesome. All right, great. So um, I'm looking at, uh, at the chat uh, in the, the webinar, any any questions? Uh, so if we have an easy audience today. Yeah. You got a what, sorry? Very have... Yeah, well, everyone's focused on the football, aren't they? Yes, yes, and, uh, yes. Rightly so as well, rightly so. England plays Scotland tomorrow, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll all be screaming Braveheart freedom at all the Scottish when we when we beat them, so we can understand that. We can understand what's going on in Belgium today, don't worry. Uh, no problem, no problem. So um, I, I currently don't see any, any questions. Um... And uh, so just, to, just to, 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 to have a little bit of an idea here, so... Uh, you're adding um, Google, then Azure. Any any ideas on timing there? No. So Google will be there for the Black Hat release in August, um, which is um, which is there. And with all the with all the Google rules, Azure will come at some point later. I'm not sure where where yet. We'll just kind of build it on demand. Like we said, we've got four full time engineers here. So if people want Azure, I know Azure is a lot more popular in Europe than it is here in the states. So. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. let us know. We're happy to build stuff. So someone just asked, I just saw a question about Kubernetes. So for sure, right? Like, so again, if you go back to that matrix that I had, like, you know, generally that workload protection is kind of in that top corner. And in general, the tooling is collapsing into one space. Um, so yes, Kubernetes will become a high pry and I expect to have it complete before the end of the year. Um, there's a couple of things that you kind of kind of do in there is, is A, of course, this DMAP technology allows you to find where Kubernetes is running on EC2 instances, which is extremely important. And I don't think any other CSPMs do that. And then once you do it, you'll need some level of credentials to get onto the Kubernetes cluster to go figure out you know, whether it's kubectl or whatever, whatever the whatever the the way that you go do it is to to figure out the configuration checks. But absolutely, and again, the architecture supports it. And yes, we will be we'll be prioritizing it for sure. Regarding on-prem, Mark, do you want to jump on that as well? I mean, yeah, we've even, yeah. had on-prem scanning working internally, but never you know productionalized it at we Open can, Raven. Yeah, we can open. I guess I'm being recorded, but like, yeah, well, we can open source it. So, so we built um, we built it on top of ZMap um, with the idea that people wanted to aggregate both their network stuff and the cloud stuff to essentially form a CMDB, right? A cloud database configuration management. Um, as a company, it didn't make sense because we're we're a, we're a cloud company, right? And and we didn't want to confuse people. So, but you know, adding an open source plugin makes makes perfect sense. And what some people would like to do with that is take the endpoints that they have or scan the perimeter. And then potentially if they've got OS query deployed on the endpoints, you can go pull things in as well. And what we're seeing is some people are using OS query actually to manage containers in the cloud as well. So um, yeah, there's definitely some things there. We, I, I don't think it's gonna be a priority for us, but there's no reason why we can't open source the repo if anyone's interested in working on that. That would be a great thing for people to work on for sure. And there's some interesting things that you can do there as well from a perspective of internally, you know all the assets, you know the security groups. Externally, you go scan the perimeter and you can see, you know, this claims to be exposed to the internet, but it may not be. It may be firewalls or other things blocking it, but you can see what's exposed to the internet. You can look up the IPs. Amazon has a straight big IP address range and then you can correlate what's outside on the internet versus actually what you think is and internally. So there's, there's a lot of, again, interesting use cases of like, you know, spanning, spanning stuff for sure. So, yeah. We have a question from um, from Magna Logan. What's the difference? What's the difference from other CSPM tools such as OpenCSPM or Cloud Spoit? Are the mm -hmm. users allowed to create their own policies and rules? Yeah, Open OpenCSPM is written in Ruby. I'll leave it there. Um, I, you know, uh, go go run that in production if you feel like it. Ha, ha, have at it. Um, and then CloudSpoit for sure, but CloudSpoit for the most part is, you know, become, um, you know, become commercial. It's, it's aqua, right? The, the key difference is really is around DMAP and around some of these other plugins. Like for the most part, like the base release that's getting released at, at Black Hat is very comparable to the, you know, the Divi clouds, the, the CloudSpoit, which is now aqua, you know, Prisma. But it's the architecture around the plugins and things like DMAP, which allows you to identify non-native data stores, things like the Shadow Account Watcher that allows you to correlate stuff that's off, off plan. Um, and, and then the other thing that I would say as well is like Python evaluation rules, which uh, uh, Open, Open CSPM does a really good job of. Like one of the things they kind of figured out early on is this is not just about, about configuration checks and they've done a, a very good job around that for sure. But the, the last question about the open policies and rules there is absolutely uh, really the config file for Magpie, you specify the Git repositories for your policies and rules. That can be our Open Raven supported ones, it can be private ones you've got on GitHub or third party as well. It's really, um, you know, it, it's, it's done on Git by default, by, by design, so that it's open and shareable. Yeah, so you, you could create a, you know, a, a local team can go create their own rules, you can fork our rules, build your own, they can be pulled from a private repo, you know, build complex things with Python for sure that you don't want to share, Ho hopefully people will share them and put them out and we'll build, build, build mm -hmm. the best, you know, biggest best rule set. Um, like like I said, it, we got four, four full time engineers you, and they'll, they'll be building rules. From. Does the repository also keep track of changes and when it was changed? Like, okay, it's it's fine to do a query on a real time. I would say uh, a dump of your of your current configuration, but it would be mm -hmm. interesting to find out were there any policy breaches over the last couple of months and when uh -huh. were they? 
So, so that's in that enterprise architecture of streaming it into a lake house. You can go and then go build, go build trend stuff out, right? And yeah. that's exactly why that architecture was was there. So you can look at trend times, trends over time, or go back. Like, hey, look, we got breached on Monday. What was the state of things on Sunday? Because it doesn't look, it looks different here. Exactly. What was the change that happened, right? So, yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. All right. Uh, another question from uh, from Michael Logan. How easy would it be to create the rules? Uh, will they be in YAML files? Jason, I think you showed it, right, Jason? But maybe you yeah, can share your screen. Yeah, let me, let me bring it up again. I'll, I'll show it off quickly here. Uh, one second. So yeah, the, the rules are straight up YAML and, and SQL. So that was by design as well. So if you look at the, the rules here, and I'm not sure if my screen is, is hard to read, but- Yeah, YAML, SQL, okay. and Python, Jason, just for, for clarity, right? Yes, exactly. So, um, you know, YAML definition, the actual rule of SQL. You know, the way it works is if your SQL query returns identifiers, in this case, they're ARNs for Amazon, those are considered to be the violating uh, assets for that policy, for that rule. So it, it's really, it's not, not complicated. Most, most of these queries are under a couple lines of SQL, um, you know, densely formatted. And that's really the gist of it. Um, it it's, it's easily created, it's easily defined. Anyone can read it and understand what it is, what it's supposed to do. Yeah, computer science essentially it's predicate, right? Yep, yep. Great, all right. I'm not seeing any more other questions. No questions. Okay. No, well, we have um, we have an open Slack channel, um, which if you want to follow along and see all the commits and and everything else, um, which we can uh, we can we can send you guys around that. Definitely. Um, yeah. If you send us yeah. over the I would say PDF of slides, uh, any any Slack Slack channels, other other pointers, we'll be sharing that uh, on the chapter page. Yeah, and for also sure. We'll um, be, yeah, sharing the recording yeah. of the session as well. Yeah, and my apologies about my technical incompetence at the beginning. I, you know, I'm sorry. I'm getting old. What can I say? <laughs> no worries, no worries. I'll uh, also share my screen to, uh, to I would say, uh, pitch the last uh, slide of our OWASP uh, uh, chapter page. So if you if you liked what you've seen, make sure to subscribe to the Belgium uh, YouTube channel. Um, become a member of our meetup group, LinkedIn group, follow us on Twitter, check out the chapter web uh, page. So there is no excuse for not having seen this or any future session. We're looking forward uh, to see you in the keynote in September, Mark. Yes, and, yes. Uh, oh. yeah, I've dug up a lot of old photos and a lot of old slides and a lot of, uh, a lot of good stories. So uh, it, will, it, will be, it will be entertaining. And you're featured in there as well, Sebastian. So you know, don't think you can get away with it, mate. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Looking forward to that. And uh, success with uh, the Arsenal uh, session at Black Hat. I Thank won't you. be there, unfortunately, um, but uh, we'll probably be seeing it uh, online. Yeah. Great. Right. Thanks Bye -bye. for listening. Thank you.